This video will provide a comprehensive overview of the key concepts covered in Chapter 10, Capacity Management. Capacity is simply the capability of a manufacturer or service system, such as a facility or process, workstation or piece of equipment, to accomplish its purpose or to produce output in a period of time. For example, a single barber may have the capacity to cut hair at a rate of four people per hour, or an oil refinery can refine 150,000 barrels of oil per day. Capacity management is hugely important to operations management because if we don't have sufficient capacity to meet demand, we risk missing out on revenues and profits, and if we have too much capacity, our facilities sit underutilized. Capacity can be viewed in one of two ways. First, we can take an output-based view of capacity. For example, a Foxconn factory can produce 400,000 iPhones per day. Alternatively, there's an input-based view of capacity. For example, an auto repair facility has daily labor capacity of 160 hours. The biggest challenge with capacity is having the right amount of it to meet demand. This is the demand versus capacity problem. At some point, for virtually all products and services, demand can exceed capacity and capacity can exceed demand. Take a movie theater for example. On weekends, popular movies can sell out completely and there are no more seats available. This is where demand exceeds capacity and money is left on the table or missed opportunity. Then, say on a Monday, even popular movies can have empty seats. This is where capacity exceeds demand and where we simply have no sales. Despite knowing both of these situations will exist at some point, it's extremely difficult and mostly impossible to scale capacity to meet demand exactly. Capacity decisions are usually very costly and tend to be focused on the long term. Capacity decisions are often influenced by economies and diseconomies of scale. Economies of scale are achieved when the average unit cost of a good or service decreases as the capacity and or volume of throughput increases. For example, an oil refinery with a capacity of 300,000 barrels per day will have a lower production cost per barrel than a refinery with a capacity of 150,000 barrels per day. As capacity increases, costs are spread over more and more output, reducing the cost per unit. Diseconomies of scale occurs when the average unit cost of the good or service begins to increase as the capacity and or volume of throughput increases. For example, as the number of rooms in a hotel continues to increase, the average cost per unit begins to increase because of the larger amount of overhead and operating expenses required by higher levels of amenities like parking, restaurants, and recreational facilities. Obviously, developing economies of scale is a more desirable scenario. One way to achieve economies of scale is through something called a focused factory. A focused factory takes just that, a focused approach on production in five ways to maximize efficiency and effectiveness. First is to focus on a few key products rather than a plethora of different products. This allows for better utilization of equipment and resources. Focus factories also employ specific technologies. For example, mill workshops may use programmable computerized cutting and routing machines, or as we'll likely see in the future, 3D printing. Third is to emphasize a certain process or capability. For example, a transmission repair shop will only focus on fixing transmissions and nothing else. Fourth is to emphasize a specific competitive priority, such as low cost or product variation, but not both. Finally, a focused factory can focus on a particular market segment or customer. For example, a mattress manufacturer that only focuses on mattresses for hotel chains. There's a common saying in business, what gets measured gets done. Well, that also applies to capacity. If we can't measure it, we can't manage it. There are three common measures of capacity. First, there's theoretical capacity, which is the maximum rate of output that can be produced in a period of time under ideal operating conditions. For example, if we operated our factory 16 hours per day, seven days a week, we could produce 100,000 widgets per week. Next is effective capacity. This is actual capacity that can reasonably be expected to be achieved in the long run under normal operating conditions. For example, we actually operate our factory 12 hours per day, six days a week, and we can produce 90,000 widgets per week. Then there's the safety capacity, which is the amount of capacity reserved for unanticipated events such as demand surges, material shortages, equipment breakdowns, etc. For example, if we needed to, we could add on an extra four hours each day for three workdays. Capacity can also be measured for a specific job via our work order specification of work to be performed for a customer or client. Here, we want to know how much capacity a particular job or order will use to help us determine what's left to allocate to other jobs and projects and to aid in scheduling. Capacity is managed both in the long term and in the short term. From a long term perspective, we might consider decisions such as the construction of a new manufacturing plant, expanding the size and number of beds in a hospital, 
or the number of new bank branches to open a new market. Long-term capacity decisions are typically expensive and difficult to change once made. One of the common long-term strategies companies use is complementary goods and services, which are those that can be produced or delivered using the same resources available to a firm, but whose seasonal demand patterns are out of phase with each other. For example, Honda might leverage economies of scale developed in small engines to manufacture lawn mowers for sale in spring and summer, and then snow blowers for sale in late fall and winter. When demand for lawn mowers, the orange line, hits its peak in late summer and is expected to start declining, there's no point in making more lawn mowers. But Honda knows that snowblower demand will start increasing, so they would produce snowblowers. Conversely, when snowblower demand, the green line, hits its peak, it's time to shift production to lawn mowers in preparation for spring. At some point, the decision has to be made to increase capacity to minimize the opportunity cost of lost sales if demand steadily increases over time. There are four general approaches to increasing capacity. First, and the most expensive, is to bite the bullet and make one large investment in a new facility. Here, capacity is fixed and at some point, demand exceeds capacity resulting in lost revenue. For example, this could be where Exxon might add on a new oil refinery, which is a very expensive proposition, I might add, in order to increase capacity to meet demand for gasoline. Alternatively, small capacity increases can be made to match demand. This is like chasing demand, and we see numerous smaller increases in capacity. This is less expensive initially than biting the bullet on a large single capacity increase, but it typically costs more over time. Third is to make capacity increases that lead demand. Here, capacity always exceeds demand, and the operation will have excess capacity or safety capacity to meet unanticipated demand. The last option is to make small capacity increases that lag demand. Here, capacity will always be less than demand, and there will be shortages, but rarely will capacity go underutilized. Now on to short-term capacity management. Examples of short-term capacity decisions might include overtime scheduling, the number of ER nurses on call during a festival weekend, or the number of call center workers to staff during the holiday season. Capacity in the short term can be managed by adjusting capacity where possible, or by influencing demand. One of the ways to adjust capacity on the supply side is to add or share equipment. A second approach is to sell unused capacity to another outside buyer or even a competitor. For example, a mattress manufacturer might sell unused capacity to IKEA to manufacture mattresses to IKEA specifications. A third supply side approach is to change labor capacity and schedules. Fourth is to change the labor mix, which could be accomplished through cross training. The last supply side approach is adjusting capacity to shift workload to slack periods, which may help create buffer inventory to meet peak demand periods without having to hire additional workers or incur overtime. Alternatively, firms can try to influence demand. One of the ways this can be accomplished is by varying the price of goods or services to direct customers to buy goods and services in off-peak periods. For example, half-price Tuesdays at a movie theater can help shift demand from busy weekends to an otherwise slow day of the week. We can provide customers with information on when the best times might be to use a service or buy a product. The classic demand influencing approach is through advertising and promotion to drive sales in low demand periods. A fourth demand side approach is to add peripheral goods and services. An example might be movie theaters renting out auditoriums for business meetings and functions when movies aren't playing. Finally, firms can provide reservations for perishable assets, which reduce uncertainty for both the customer and the service provider. A perishable asset is one for which revenue is lost forever if it goes unused. Classic examples include airline seats, hotel rooms, concert seats, or cruise state rooms. Another way to manage perishable assets like hotel rooms and rental cars is through employing sophisticated revenue management systems, or RMS, which consist of dynamic methods to forecast demand, allocate perishable assets across market segments, decide when to overbook and buy how much, and determine what price to charge different customers. The last major concept in Chapter 10 is learning curves. A learning curve illustrates how labor cost decreases in a predictable manner as the experiencing and producing the unit increases. It's based on the simple premise that as humans become more proficient at a task, it takes less time to complete the more they do it. This effect can also be described as an experience curve where the cost of doing any repetitive task, work activity, or project decreases as the accumulated experience of doing the job increases. You can probably think of a task you performed where, for the first time, it took a lot of time and effort, but as you kept doing it, you got way better at it. Here's an example of a learning curve chart which shows that the first unit of a product takes 3,500 minutes to manufacture or assemble. 
After the 50th unit, the time drops to about 2,000 minutes and continues to drop, albeit at a slower, decreasing rate, eventually leveling out. Providing goods and services requires the employment of various productive assets including technology, equipment and people. Developing sufficient capacity is imperative to ensuring undisrupted supply of goods and services, and that's a difficult task, as firms seek to minimize both the amount of unused capacity if there's too much of it, and lost sales when there isn't enough capacity.